How many times in recent weeks have you felt grateful? Were you grateful it snowed and we had some time off? Grateful a teacher may have given you some extra time to take a test? Were you grateful for the dinner your parents made for you last night? Were you grateful that an ill friend or family member was recovering? These are all very different ways you could feel grateful. Grateful to me is based on perspective. And perspective is really built on your life experiences. My life experiences, therefore my perspective, in high school, college, and even entering the workplace, was far different than it is today. For example, I grew up in Florida, spent much of my life on the beach surfing and playing golf. I went to private school. I had two very loving parents. My grandparents visited us regularly. I had lots of friends. Um, my life was quite privileged. It was really very important to my mother that we were grateful for all that we were blessed with. I remember every Christmas wrapping presents for those less fortunate that lived near us, volunteering for different charities. And I especially remember my mom saying something. You should always give your best, give with heart, and most importantly, give back. To sum it up, in my world then, I had never really wanted for food on my plate, clothes on my back, a good education, a warm bed, paper and a pencil. So my grateful related to my world experiences. And yeah, I was grateful at that time. As my life progressed and life experiences grew, grateful changed. Um, I was grateful when my mom was in a car accident and survived and she had great doctors. I was grateful for getting my first real job, meeting my husband, having healthy children. Fast forward to 2010. In 2010, a seven magnitude earthquake hit the country of Haiti. I remember vividly the horrific photos of children naked in the streets, scared, homeless people, buildings collapsed, built, people struggling to find lost loved ones. It was everywhere, every TV station, every day for weeks. Days and weeks passed, and the focus turned from Haiti to other things. It was almost like it was a sad movie that I had watched, and it kind of disappeared from memory. The following year, I actually had an opportunity to go on a mission trip to Haiti through an organization called Visiting Orphans. The trip was for two weeks in November in 2011, so a year after the earthquake. The plan was to visit approximately 10 orphanages in Haiti and do our best to provide some of the most basic essential needs, food, water, clothes, anything these orphanages were in need of. Um, even as I planned, I really had no idea what to expect. Many of my students jumped in to help raise money and um, collect items for my trip. Um, and we were all very interested in learning more about Haiti. So together we started gathering data. And here's some facts that may interest you. Haiti's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It's on the island of Hispaniola and shares the island with the Dominican Republic. The population is almost 11, uh, 11 million people, but the square area is actually, um, Florida's five times as big. $400 is about how much the average Haitian can expect to make in a year. After the earthquake, there were over one million orphans, yet there are only 760 orphanages in Haiti. If you do the math, that means the majority of those orphans were really homeless or living in what they call tent cities. Of the orphans in orphanages, it's estimated that 70% of these children have one or two living parents who want them, but have no access to health, education, or social services in the community, or live in an area so dangerous they're afraid for their life. An orphan in Haiti is defined as a child 14 and under. So what happens after 14? The life expectancy in Haiti is 50 to 54 years old, and adult literacy is only 46%. It's believed that one-third of the population um, have jobs. But Haiti's also very rich in history and has a vibrant culture and is beautiful. It's one of the longest coastlines in the Caribbean, and it's also one of the most mountainous. Haiti is the only nation in the world 
whose independence was gained as a part of a successful slave rebellion in 1801. During the 17th and 18th centuries, Haiti produced 40% of the sugar consumed in the world and 60% of the coffee and was considered the richest colony in the French Empire. It was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. People of Haiti practice you know, several religions, um, even voodoo. Um, and of all the Caribbean nations, perhaps none has a richer tradition of visual arts in Haiti. In the capital, Port-au-Prince, which is where I went, um, they had heavily pimped out in public transportation um, that looked like mobile art displays. Each day that I was there, I blogged. Um, and here's an excerpt from one day. It's November 12th. I'm overcome by the color of everything in Haiti as we drove to the orphanage. Gray everywhere. You turn from the buildings, the dirt roads, the gray dust that fills the air and covers the people. You can't escape the dust, and it's only made worse by the blazing sun and swarms of exhaust from the other tap taps, motorcycles, and cars squeezing down the narrow streets. I almost forgot. A tap tap is the local mode of transportation. It resembles a pickup truck. It's low to the ground, and it has a cage around it, um, all around the outside. And they're covered in very colorful paintings. The roads were covered in potholes that were huge, some 20 feet wide. We had to get out of the tap tap many times to get over the potholes and then pile back in. I looked out the tap tap, and there were people milling everywhere, selling goods of all kinds. There were people sitting on the streets cooking in front of their tents. These tents appeared everywhere. My words just can't do it justice. I kept thinking to myself, this can't be real. With all the dust and dirt and poverty, there were women frantically sweeping the streets in front of their tents, trying to make their little areas as clean as possible. They had turned large palm branches into brooms. The scene at the orphanage was different. It was outside the city a bit and down a long gravel road lined with mango trees and banana trees. As we pulled up, I did feel as though I stepped onto an old sugar plantation. There was a gate that we pulled in, and it was a very large piece of property with a house in the middle of the property. Um, but it was really like gravel everywhere else. The children were at school when we arrived, so we were able to get unloaded. And we were actually going to be providing beds for them. In Haiti, kids can only go to school if they have a uniform and closed-toed shoes. Seems crazy. The orphanages have to be able to provide this so that they can send them. If they can't, then the kids can't go. And this is one of the places that they'll be guaranteed a meal. Um, these children at this orphanage have been living in tents on the back of the property. They told us before we arrived that they had a new hut. By hut, I mean cinder blocks with a tin roof lined with bunk beds, but no, mattress, mo no mattresses, which is what, what we were there to do. It had two rooms. Girls were in one and boys were in another. And we were excited to put mattresses down and use the sheets we brought. Um, there were a total of 18 beds, but there were over 40 children at this orphanage, so two to three to a bed. And that's very common in all the orphanages in, ha in Haiti. When the ch children finally started arriving, they lit up as they saw a group of visitors. I was overcome by their politeness. They came and hugged us and made sure they said merci to each and everyone in the group. They still had energy as they had a very small breakfast. Um, we had set up a station to get started on helping them. We gave them pairs of shoes and socks. They actually had to change from their clothes immediately after arriving home and mo because most didn't have any other shoes, so they would be playing barefoot. Um, we played games, we played soccer, we made paper dolls, they loved the Play-Doh, um, we passed out the treats. Um, it's interesting, kids all around the world seem to have a universal love of lollipops. Um, the doctors and nurses that came with us were able to get an idea of medical needs, and it just felt so good to help and love on these kids. Leaving for me was the hardest. There was one little boy, his name was Smith. He took an immediate hold on me. <laughs> he was 10. He held my hand tight all day, and he just wanted hugs. He wouldn't leave or let go as I was trying to get on the tap-tap. He was so happy until then. 
I fought the tears as he just hugged me and I had to turn away to get on the truck. In the pictures, he's the little boy in the red shirt. There's so much more I could say, but I'm exhausted. I just tried to share my thoughts and experience from today and let you all be a part of my experience. As you can tell from that blog, my worldview, my life experiences, and my perspective changed immensely. I was filled with questions, and I wondered how and why I was so blessed, and these children faced so many challenges. I was grateful beyond what I had ever experienced before. Here are some photos to give you an idea of what I, just, what I saw. This trip changed my life. It felt so good being able to help others. It's made me appreciate so much more than I ever think I ever did. And I'm more grateful for, for simple things, for things like early morning wake-up calls, because I have children who have to go to school and a wonderful job to go to, a house to clean because I have a warm, safe place to live. For Play-Doh, or the idea of having access to such small luxuries that I took for granted for so long. For piles of laundry, which means I have plenty of clothes to wear and a place to clean them. A shower so I can wash off the grime at the end of a long day. Dishes to wash, because I have food to eat. Toilets to clean, which means I have indoor plumbing. Nights full of homework, because we have access to such great education for our children. I'm grateful for my bed that I never considered living without. For school, as we all sit here today learning and working, there are many places around the world there's just not the same access that we have, and people can't afford it. For our health and the access to doctors that we can go to at the smallest sign of illness, for all of the opportunity that I have, and I do my best not to waste it. For moments of silence, which means I have time to reflect and breathe and be thankful. I have a full life of wonderful people, family, cherished friends, and beautiful students. I'm grateful for you, for this amazing community to be a part of, to watch each of you grow and to learn, and I'm a better person because of you. I hope today, if anything, my meditation will make you take a moment to realize how grateful we are. Life and your life experiences may not always be perfect, but even under the most difficult circumstances, we are blessed with so much. I hope that as your world experiences change, you'll always take time to reflect, put it in perspective, and be grateful for all that you have. Give your best, give with heart, and most importantly, give back. Thank you.